um, I have the delight of introducing a classmate who's one of four members of our class to chair the General Alumni Association Board of Directors. Um, all of us remember the, the shot that Charlie Scott made. Not many of us remembered that someone had to feed him the ball and get, get credit for the assist. Um, we've known him as Commissioner of the Big Ten, a distinguished alumnus, recipient of the university, and uh, a great friend of the university whose sons also attended Carolina. Please give a warm welcome to Jim Delaney. Thank you, Doug. And uh, in particular, thanks for I inviting me back maybe 15, 18 years ago to I mean, I was living in Chicago, lived in Nashville, lived in Kansas City, and was somewhat removed, but you know, followed the teams and followed the university. And Doug got me involved with the GAA, and I stayed involved on and off for 15, 16 years, and met new people, and um, renewed some old acquaintances, and uh, became even more familiar with uh, the, the place that we all went to school. Um, let me make some preliminary uh, comments, because uh, it's really going to be about your participation in questions, and um, the panelists, um, looking back 50 years uh, on their experiences, and I'm a, I'm a free speech advocate. So if they don't want to answer the question, they could tell me they can answer whatever they want to answer. And you can ask whatever you want. Now, the only difference is I'm not going to like control how long they speak, but they, they know that they're teammates from Carolina, and so that means you have to share the ball, you've got to share the time, but some of you, you know, maybe didn't play team sports. So if you go a little bit long, I might put you on the bench where I spent a lot of my time at North Carolina. So we all got here uh, either in 66 or 68. We got here at the same time you got here. We all came from different places. Some, some people came from North Carolina, the west, uh, western part of the state. Some people came uh, more from the central Eddie was from Flushing. Charles grew up in the Harlem area, but went to school uh, in Southern Pines. I think it was the Southern Pines, Charles? Larnberg. Larnberg, Larnberg, excuse me, with Mr. McDuffie. Yep. You know, Bill, Billy is from the city area, went to high school at Lutheran. Roy's a Western North Carolina guy. And Chambers, where are you from? I'm from right Durham. Durham. Durham, right here. So, you know, he, he's, a, he's a local guy. I haven't told him this yet, but after we leave here, the three guys from 70, Charlie, and Eddie and myself are challenging Roy and Billy and Billy, okay? So we got a point guard, we got two point guards, Roy and Eddie, and then we got two great players, and two pros, two three-year starters, two great players, and then we got me and Billy. Billy's a little bit bigger than me, so I know he's gonna try to post me, but I'm ready for you. So, <laughs> so if you wanna go over to Carmichael, you know, about 5.30 or 6, we won't be there. <laughs> That's debatable. But it's good, it's good to think about. It's good, it's good to think about. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with uh, myself, and I'm going to end with Charles, and we'll talk about everybody else in the middle. I came here from New Jersey. Uh, my dad was a high school teacher and coach and gave me some great advice. When I wanted to enter the portal, which we didn't have, but we still thought about transferring uh, our team had been 28-4. and four. We lost a national championship game to UCLA. And I guess I must have thought if I had played, we would have been 29-3. and three. There's no way we would have been better. We had a really good team. And he said to me, where are you going? What are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I just want to play some more. He said, forget it. He said, just, he said, what did Coach Smith promise you? He said, he promised me an opportunity and an opportunity to get an education, not an education, an opportunity to play. And I didn't take advantage of either one of them. But, but the reality was, I'm glad that he discouraged me from leaving. It was a phenomenal experience that, that I had and had an opportunity to be with some of the people um, up here. Um, let, me, let me move to uh, Billy Chambers, because Billy and I played about the same amount of time. Um, but nobody played harder. Nobody committed more to the team. And um, I'm sure if he got a chance to play 25 minutes a game, he would get at least 25 shots up. <laughs> now, how many points he would score? I don't know. But the guy loved, he loved to play. He loved to score. And he was a great teammate. And today, he's the glue uh, about 72. Because when we come together, 
They're at Billy's condo here. Bill, very successful doctor, very successful businessman, and his wife Kathy are here all the time. I mean, they, they bring people together. It's great to be with you. Let me, let me move a little bit to Billy Chamberlain, who is probably the coolest, smoothest, smartest player that we had, amazing player. Uh, MVP of the NIT, three-year starter, had an injury here, there, professional player. And you talk about smooth, he made it look easy. Phenomenal talent, phenomenal guy, and uh, special uh, to be with him. Roy Williams is here for a reason, because Coach Smith wanted us to be part of the student body. And Roy was part of the student body after his freshman year. But he had the experience both on the freshman team and then being around the program. And so I want for him to give that perspective. You know what he's done as a coach, and we don't need to. He's Naismith Hall of Fame, three national championships, run two of the greatest programs in the history of college basketball. But I want him to talk a little bit about what it was like as a student around the program as well as being on the freshman team. The other thing is I want him to tell the truth about running the intramural program and having to deal with Coach Fogler in the championship softball game in 1972. And Charles Scott, don't be laughing down there, because I told you I believe in free speech, but there's a limit to that too. Because last night he outed me. Well, it was like the third time he outed me. Only once a weekend. Once a weekend, you can't tell that story again, because that, that's taking up valuable time on other, other kinds of things. Oh, all right, all right. So, Coach Fogler, um, people don't know how good a coach he was. He, he left the coaching in, in his early 50s, but he's coach of the year in Missouri Valley, coach of the year in the SEC at two different schools, national coach of the year at Vanderbilt. But he was a great player. They named, like, the, somebody named the top 10 point guards. I, if he's not on that list, he's got to be 11. It's a two-year starter. He could pass the ball. He was clever. And one of the few guys in New York City to make first team all, all, all city twice. Uh, that's Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. That's Tiny Archibald. Only a few people. And that was a category that he was in. And even at the time, there are a few people up here who are national recruits. But for the most part, recruiting was regional. But he was a national recruit. He was sought after by everybody. I made the mistake of coming here. We roomed together. We were fraternity brothers. I sat my ass on the bench. And we, and we lived together, and we lived together. We never had an argument. We've been friends for 50, 50 some odd years. So he's a, he's a special guy, he was a special coach. Okay, now I'm with Charles Scott. Okay, and, and everybody tags Charles Scott as the first black athlete, great black athlete to be here, but that's not the way I look at him. I look at him now, he was the son of Shannon, excuse me, the, the dad of Shannon, played Ohio State, so I saw him in that role. I, I saw him as a professional player. I saw his growth. I met his wife, Trudy, and known her uh, for the last 15 years. And what I'll say about Charles is not only was he a brilliant basketball player, he was a brilliant student, really a smart guy. He's one of the few players who played 50 years ago that could play today yeah, because that's how good an athlete he was. And we, about every 10 years, you see this major jump in athleticism. I don't care if you're watching quarterbacks play or you're watching sprinters lower the record or the long distance runners, but he was an athlete way ahead of his time, way ahead of his time. And there's no doubt in my mind as I watch these fabulous athletes today, if, you watch a, a, if you're an NBA fan and you see what they can do, he could do that then. But that's what, 55 years ago is when he came. So in addition to being a great Carolina guy, great family man, and a great pro. He was an Olympic champion. He's an NBA champion. He's a Naismith Hall of Fame. Just remarkable, special guy. And um, for all of us, especially I think for Charles and Billy and, and Eddie, when we came here, <clears throat> I know there's a lot of discussion about diversity, et cetera. And obviously the university and the society has improved a great deal. But when we came here, you know what diversity was? <laughs> Meeting a small guy, a, a little guy from Lenore or Hudson or some small town in North Carolina. We'd never seen that dude before. We never knew that guy before. And so for us to get exposed to, to and, and, and you know, there weren't many women around, like 10%, you know, whatever, it's hard to get a date. And then you really had to behave yourself up to the date or somebody would come and take your date from you. So you had to expand your pool, high school, Greensboro, whatever, it wasn't easy. My two sons came here and I said, how many women are in Carolina? They said, oh, 63%. I said, give me a break. <laughs> we were dealing with 10, 12%. So everybody had to find their social life someplace. We all survived. We had an unbelievable sort of experience here. We were here at the same time you were here, which was Vietnam War. 
It was urban violence. It was Watergate. Yeah. It was black liberation. It was all the liberation movements coming together. So in those years, uh, we, we, all, we all got prepared for the 2010s and 2020s because things really flattened out for a while in the, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But we went through that. We went to class sometimes. In fact, I met a guy the other day who was in class with me at, P, uh, at a Poli Sci 41. I said, was I, did I come to class? He said, you were there a couple times. I said, are, are you willing to testify that under oath? <laughs> I said, because there aren't many guys around here like that. But nevertheless, it was an amazing, it was an amazing experience. Uh, uh, each of you are going to have a chance to answer the question, not answer the question, interact with each other. But what I want to do is start off with Roy, and because Roy came out of the mountains of North Carolina down here, and talk about, Roy, what made you think about Carolina and why you came here. And if you hadn't gone here, where, where would have you gone? Should I use this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, I looked around up here, and I'm a lot different than these guys up here. <laughs> uh, I couldn't play, and I wasn't big enough, fast enough, or any of those kind of things, but I did love the game. And when I look up here, uh, I said a little bit last night at one of the deals, our freshman year, our freshman year, the seniors, uh, Rusty Clark, Bill Bunning, Joe Brown, uh, Dick Grubar, Gerald Tuttle, those guys made my decision to come to North Carolina the greatest decision I ever made because I fell in love with North Carolina basketball. Uh, not to dwell on anything because I had a wonderful childhood, but uh, we never talked about education in my family. My uh, dad's quit school in the sixth grade, was an alcoholic, married five times. My mom was his first. My mom quit school in the tenth grade to go to work in a cotton mill in Rutherford County, North Carolina. I call it the Redneck Riviera now because that's, that's where all my relatives live. Uh, but uh, I tell them it's a lot better than they think it is. Uh, but it was a different situation for me because I came here because of my high school basketball coach. I didn't ever even think about going to college until my junior year. And he said, no, you need to think about going to college. And uh, uh, the thing, I liked education, but I don't know what I really liked it in that sense of the tone. Uh, when you're in the first grade, second grade, they give you satisfactory or unsatisfactory on your report card. <laughs> and so my third grade year, uh, teacher put up the top 10 students and we all of us grew up in American bandstand time my sister was really thrilled she watched it every afternoon but they had the top 10 songs and so my teacher put up on the bulletin board the top 10 students of the last six weeks grading period and uh, my name wasn't up there and there's only 25 of us so <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that big a challenge uh, but uh, uh, it sort of ticked me off. And at that time, I decided I was going to be on that list. And the, so the next, well, there's only six grading periods of the year, but the next five, my name was number one on the list. And so that's the first time I ever thought, looking back on it, that the competition was important to me, that I loved that, that part of it to the extent that I put my key in the door before the other coach gets his tea out, a key out of the pocket, and I say, beat you. And he said, I didn't know it was competition. And I said, everything is competition. <laughs> but so I took my grades home to my mom, and it really made her happy. And that was the way that I got interested in education because my sister was four years older, and my mom was never really sad about my sister's grades, but it didn't impress her like it did when I brought the A's home. And so that's the reason I got a little more interested in education, just because it was competition. I didn't want this guy to make an A and me make a B. And, uh, but then all of a sudden, I was a junior, and my high school coach told me I should think about going to college, and he wanted me to go to North Carolina because he had gone to North Carolina and had been a freshman on the freshman team that Coach Smith was coaching. Because after my freshman year, it's when I decided I wanted to be a coach because my high school coach was the first person to give me confidence and make me feel good about myself, and I decided I wanted to be a coach the rest of my life. But Coach Smith was very impressive to my high school coach. And he said, you want to be a coach in North Carolina should be where you go. You can watch Coach Smith. You can play on the freshman team. I think you'll have a chance to make the freshman team, and you'll learn more about basketball. And so for me coming down here, I mean, I never forget standing in front of James Dorm looking up there, and my, my mom and an aunt brought me to school. 
And my mom never came back to Chapel Hill again until we gra I graduated. And it, for her, it was I was a mouth that she didn't have to feed for those years, which was which was good. But I came here and standing looking up at that big dorm and think, my God, son, you're here on your own, and you better not screw this up. And basketball for me, seeing those senior guys with Charlie and, and Eddie and Jimmy, the, the basketball was at such a high level. And what Coach Smith was doing was unique, the pressure defense, the run and jump, and those kind of things. So I fell in love with, uh, with the North Carolina basketball team at that time. And then I was a freshman uh, player, the, about the last player on the team. But I loved to play, and I loved Coach Guthridge and learned so much then. But coming from Western North Carolina, at Robertson High School, we had Wanda's here. We had 140 students in our class. And uh, it wasn't a very big deal, but I was about the biggest fish in that pond. I played baseball, played basketball. I was president student body. I had the lead role in the senior play. And if you really want to laugh, I'll give you the best laugh you can have all day. Nobody can top this. I was on Duke's campus before I was ever on North Carolina's campus and uh, at the Duke Folk Festival. Because the square, freaking square dance team at Robertson High School danced at the Duke Folk Festival. So I was on the square dance team at Robertson High School, and we danced with Joan Baez and B.B. Uh, uh, oh, wow. King with the guitar, uh, Lucille, or whatever his name is. Guitar. And uh, so we left Duke and stopped in Chapel Hill because the sponsor of the uh, uh, square dance team thought she wanted me to see Chapel Hill. She said this is where she wanted me to go. And I came in, and we spent a couple hours here, and I loved the campus. But it was Buddy Baldwin that got me to come here. But these guys and what Coach Smith and all of these guys here represented got me more interested in education and coaching and things like that. But uh, we looked up to these guys. These are still my heroes. And I told the, the seniors uh, several years ago, the seniors on that team in 68, 69, that they were my heroes, and they always will be. And, uh, but these guys up here really made Roy Williams fall in love with North Carolina even more. And I tell you what, I think some of you guys fell in love with North Carolina, the University of North Carolina, more because of the basketball team. So that was, that was my story. And, and Charlie knows this is true. Wicked Wanda sitting over there. Our first son, our first child was a boy, and I named him Scott, or we named him Scott. It was because what Charlie Scott put up with and the way he performed here during those tough times was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen in my life. And uh, I'm very sincere. I, uh, the old baseball teammate of mine took me to Raleigh s Charlie's senior year. And uh, those people, what they were yelling at Charlie's the worst things I'd ever heard in my life. And the funny thing about it is at the end of the game, he made about five or six big jump shots in a row. And, I'm standing up yelling at the entire Reynolds Coliseum crowd. <laughs> and my former baseball teammate said, you've got to shut up. and We've got to get out of here. You're going to get us into a fight. And I said, well, we're beating their blankety blank out there on the court. We can beat them in the stands too. But uh, So, Charlie, it was because of what I thought you put up with and how much uh, I knew how difficult that was. And I was not in your shoes. But it was the most embarrassing thing I'd ever heard in Raleigh. And that, to this day, is the reason I hate those blankety blanks so much. Hey, 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 Roy, you weren't. Roy! You weren't in his shoes, nor were Eddie and I, but we were next to his shoes. And when they tried to spit on him, they got us. Yeah. <laughs> so, so they never got him. He was kind of thin. He was quick, thin, off. <laughs> well, that was like Duke, the game that we were down 7 nothing at halftime in Duke in 1978. Somebody, one of the Duke students had a rotten grapefruit and they threw it at Coach Smith and missed and hit me. <laughs> Thanks, Roy. <clears throat> to, 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 to put Roy in a little bit of context, not only a great basketball coach, a, a, a great guy, probably to my knowledge, the most generous, Ian Wanda, to this university of any coach that I'm familiar with. I, I work with uh, 71 football coaches in the Big Ten, 55 basketball coaches, 
And what he and Wanda have done, they, they stepped up big time. And so thank you for your generosity. That's really special, Roy. So we start off with 1972, so we gotta go to a 1970 guy. And so I'd like uh, to, to ask Eddie a couple questions. One, um, g going back, looking at your career at Carolina, um, give me the sweetest moment, the sweetest win, the, the thing that stands out for you while you played here. And then, as a coach, the sweetest win, the thing that stands out. A couple, and there could be a couple there, but I'd like to hear from a player's perspective what has stayed in your mind, and, and then as a coach, what has stayed in your mind in terms of, uh, of wins. Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh, first of all, let me say I want to echo what Jim just said about Roy and Wanda in terms of their generosity to back to the university and how they represented the university all those years in an uh, industry that's getting crazier and crazier all the time. I am in the transfer portal. My wife put me there this morning. <laughs> I mean, that's how crazy the transfer portal is. Um, and by the way, we, few, before I answer the questions, Jim, this is a roster of when Roy was on the freshman team here at the university. You know, Bill was on that team and, 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 and Bill Chamberlain. For the record, Roy Williams was 5'9", 138 pounds. Um, Jim, I think for me, um, as a player, um, I think it's when you made the pass to Charlie <laughs> and I was on the bench where I should have been. I think, uh, that was certainly a, a memorable, uh, a memorable game experience. Um, as a coach, I think the 82 championship, uh, Roy and I went out to dinner the night before in New Orleans. I still remember we... Coach Smith sent us to one of these fancy New Orleans restaurants. It was literally Roy Seven Courses. You remember that? They brought out this big sculpture of some bird with you know little pouches, and the food was on and caviar and all this stuff. And and we're sitting there going, "What are we doing here?" And, and it was like I don't know, 175 bucks a person. This back in '82, and um, I think that game, you know, when Coach Smith was able to you know, break through, I mean, seven times to the final four, but to get his first national championship, I think, as a coach uh, was the most memorable for me. I think as a player, um, I can still remember, honest to gosh, there was a, back here where there's parking, when we were freshmen, there was an outdoor court. And we lived in Avery, right across the street. And we were out there playing one day, first time. You know, the freshman got there. It was Jim and I and, and, and Charlie. And uh, it's the first time I ever saw Charlie Scott play. And I went, holy shit. <laughs> pardon, pardon my French. Because that's the first time I'd seen Charlie. And then for four years, you know how else I saw Charlie? Coach Smith would do wind sprints, you know. And they was running group A for the fastest. So Jim and I were in running group A. Of course, Charlie was in running group A. I saw Charlie's rear end for four years. <laughs> he was the fastest and never tired. Never got tired. And Jim and I were, I, th I thought we were on track scholarship my, my freshman year with Larry Brown. And so, but the other thing I would say about the experience here, being from New York, I, I grew up playing with and against African-American players. And when I came here, I really had no idea. Quite honestly, I was first time I was away from home. I had six 8 a.m. classes in the morning. I was dumb enough. We went six days a week back then. I was dumb enough to take 8 a.m. classes because that's what I did in high school. That was hard. I was trying to keep up with Delaney at night. That was tough. <laughs> oh, I had to get that one in. Um, but to go through the four years and as Jim referenced, what uh, or, or Roy referenced, you know the things that were heard at state and other places. I really didn't understand that back then, and and then Bill followed. Um, and as I reflect back on that and think about that, I think about how naive I was and how out of touch I was. But I also think about what Charlie and Bill went through and how meaningful it was for them to come here to the university 
and go through a lot of crap and whatever they did to make it here be successful here where today we we have so many successful African American students, student athletes, and what they meant to the university coming here back in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. So I really do think about that a lot and, uh, you know, kind of proud and honored to gone through it, but kind of embarrassed that I didn't realize more of what was going on when I was here uh, during that time. Uh, subsequently for me, I went into coaching, um, coached here for 15 years, uh, two years as a grad assistant, 13 years as an assistant coach. So I put 19 years, not put, I was honored to be here 19 years uh, around Coach Smith. And that was truly a unique, uh, great experience to see behind the scenes uh, how much more than just the basketball coach, the great basketball coach he was, and then subsequently went on to coach myself for 15 years as a head coach. The day didn't go by then, and the day, didn't, does, day doesn't go by almost today where I don't think about Coach Smith at least once a day. Uh, I'll tell you one story about Coach Smith. Uh, he calls up one time. He says, Eddie, how's it going? And we didn't have a very good team. I said, uh, Coach, we're not very good. I said, I said, oh, I got a good idea for you. I said, what's that, Coach Smith? He goes, Praise those actions that you want repeated. I said, even with your children, praise those actions that you want repeated. So I hung, I hang the phone up, and Jeff Lebo, who's on the staff here now with Uber, was one of my assistant coaches. This is with South Carolina. So Jeff comes in. We go to practice. I said, hey, just talk to Coach Smith. He said, what do he say? How's it going? I said, he said, we got to praise those actions that we want repeated. So we go to practice. And within 10 minutes of practice, we're, we're running a fast break drill. We got three on one. Got to get a layup or a foul. My point guard throws it out of bounds. I turn to Jeff, who's standing behind me. I go, should I praise that action? <laughs> Coach Smith's everywhere. He's, he's everywhere. Nice pass. <laughs> um, then, yeah. And... And then I surrendered from coaching in 2001. I knew it was crazy then. It's a lot more crazy today, much more than I ever dreamed. Intercollegiate athletics is uh, kind of really wacky right now, and change needs to be made. Intercollegiate athletics will miss Jim tremendously, although he's still, I, I hope, involved on the periphery with his wisdom and knowledge because uh, uh, we need good leadership here. So that being said, uh, congratulations to Hubert and the team this year. Great to see that. <laughs> thank, and thank, thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. thanks, thanks, uh, thanks, Eddie. Um, really, um, what's the best way to say this? You know, how how can you compete against a guy every day in practice? Get beat out by him, live with him, be a fraternity brother of his, a co-captain and never have a cross word in our relationship in all that time. That's true. That's, uh, that, 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 that was a special, special uh, relationship that continues, uh, continues on to this day. But one of the things, he, he talked a little bit about his coaching and a little bit about his playing. He recruited Michael. He recruited Phil. He recruited James. <clears throat> and if Billy... And Charles aren't here. Those doors aren't open for the University of North Carolina. So they opened doors, and Coach Smith and Eddie and Roy, Coach Guthridge and Coach Lotz were, were able to build a team with great players, great people, and leave great legacies. So I, I want you to know um, he left it because he had more integrity um, than he was comfortable with and going head to head. It was just not a, a healthy place then. It's not all that healthy now, but I have tremendous respect for him. Let me pivot. <clears throat> Let me pivot uh, to Billy Chamberlain. Billy came in, I guess it was in 68, and played on the freshman team, a uh, really strong freshman team. They had Previs and they had Wysik. Um, who else did you have on that freshman team starters? Kim, great shooter from Wilmington, right? And who and who was your who was your point guard? Previs. Previs. Previs was at the point. Previs. Really good player. Fred Corson. 
Corson from Kentucky, New Hampshire. We, we, Kentucky, New Hampshire, we called him La Grand Rouge. <laughs> he was 6'9", big red, and really, that, that dude could run too. He could really run too. Could play, but could run. <laughs> Charlie could play and run. <laughs> So, so Billy, uh, talk a little bit about Lutheran, how you got to Lutheran, and then how you got to North Carolina. Sort, sort of give us that uh, experience, and then talk about a, a, a key moment or two for you from a playing standpoint here. You know, there's, there's so much uh, that comes to mind, but I'll try to keep it within the ballpark. Mm -hmm. But the opportunity to go to Long Island Lutheran High School happened because a guy that was recruiting my brother, John, who's 6'8", 265, to go to CW Post College, uh, came to the apartment. And, were you, where, and where were you living at that time? On Convent Avenue, 305 Convent in Harlem, New York. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, after trying to spiel with you know my parents to recruit John, and John did end up going to post, uh, he said, "What about this guy?" You know, I'm sitting there like, Pfft. I'm just happy to be listening. Well, he says, "Well, I know a person out of out of Lutheran High School. Would you like to get Billy?" out of Harlem or New York City schools for high school. And my mother said, if you can get him out of here, I'll get the ground you walk on. <laughs> uh, true story. <laughs> and it wasn't so much. And how old were you at the time? Were you uh, 15, 16? Yeah, 16. 16. It wasn't so much that I didn't even think things were bad <laughs> in Harlem mm -hmm. uh, because I wasn't trying to do bad things, mm -hmm. but a lot of my friends that were great ball players, mm -hmm. and Charlie will tell you this, were, were messing around with drugs and uh, and doing all kinds of things mm -hmm. in street street life, which is not conducive to longevity, and a lot of them didn't live long. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys were gone at 18, 19 years of age that had a world potential, but that's all it was, mm -hmm. <laughs> potential. Uh, but for me, Reverend Ed Vischer was the coach at Lutheran High School. Now picture this guy, he's a German Lutheran, and he has a, a wife named Marie, and they have like three at the time, small children. They ended up with five, but, and he, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Frankie Townsend convinces him to bring me and a guy named Bobby Cabbagestock from the Lower East Side, Cabbagestock, great name, uh, <laughs> from the Lower East Side, out to live in his house. And we went out there. And I know my mother paid every month for my room and board. I don't know about Bobby Cabbage's situation. But for me, Lutheran High School was like another world. If you can imagine this, being from the city, all concrete and steel. Nothing at all except concrete and steel. To go out to a school had a 36-acre campus, rolling hills, a football field, and a football team that was great. And I mean, everything you can imagine. As a matter of fact, one of my schoolmates, Cindy Beersley, would ride horseback to school. <laughs> you know, I mean, here I am from Harlem, going, what the hell's going on? <laughs> and, and she, and also, there were kids driving to school. I never saw anybody, a kid, driving anywhere. They were driving to school. Unless they were driving a getaway car. Well, <laughs> none of our friends 
Cause try, <laughs> you try, try to do that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they, they drive to school, man. And I'm like, what in the world's happening here? So the opportunity came for me to play on a great, uh, not a great team, a good team that had a, a great previous the t team before I got there had Chris Tomford yeah, Princeton. at the center that was at, ended up Princeton. Yeah. And Chris and I became very good friends. Uh, matter of fact, I spent a, half a summer with, with the Tomfords. Uh, a side story. The Tomfords, their family owned the ice cream parlor on 125th Street in Harlem called Tomfords, big name, I remember it all. And it was the best ice cream you ever had in the, in the world. However, what happened with them, and I had no idea at the time, was that they were the owners of Howard Johnson. Hmm. <clears throat> Think about that kind of money. <laughs> I mean, they, and, and they lived in a very nice house in Brookville, Long Island, which is a very posh neighborhood. Check the area code. But uh, I'll tell you one thing, that Chris was such a down-to-earth person. He didn't want to play professional basketball. He ended up going to Asia to be a minister to try to convince the Asian people in some either, not China, but an Asian country to become Christians. And he's, he came back and was the president of a university. In Minnesota, St. Olaf's. Huh? St. Olaf's in Minnesota. Exactly. Uh, beautiful man. Yep. Beautiful guy. Uh, and um, I say this to say, all that the Lutheran High School experience was a watershed for me because at the end of my senior year, we played great ball, played against the Master with James Brown, you see the uh, NFL guy you see on TV with the black hair, come on James, it's gotta be great by now. Uh, but uh, you know, um, <clears throat> we had great teams that played great schedule uh, and we ended up, I ended up getting so many re recruiting letters, over 175, that I got to thinking I was great. <laughs> you know, you get to reading your press and you, you start believing, I must be great. They're writing about me. Well, the fact is, I was okay. I was pretty good. I couldn't shoot worth a lick, but I could go to the basket, <laughs> you know. You were smooth. You were smooth. I, I was, Admit it. Did you know you were smooth? No. No. I just avoided. No, no, you were smooth. I just, I just avoided contact. I know. Contact. You avoided You avoided contact. that. But contact you couldn't have avoided the contact if you hadn't been smooth. Contact did not work for me. All right. I mean, because I was right. like, well, I got And you it. couldn't shoot either, but you occasionally. Exactly. <laughs> we ran some stuff for you. I was 165 pounds. Yeah. You know? No, you're a really, really good player. I mean, I'm getting, I'm getting pounded. We're playing South Carolina, and they have Roach and Rearbach. Owens, Owens, Owens. Come on. They, they were pounding people. And anyway, <laughs> anyway, it could be a long story, but the Lutheran High School experience yeah. <laughs> was what happened for me. Transformative. <laughs> Transformative. Yeah. Transformative. Hey, Bill. It's true. It really. Not going to be a long story. It is a long story. Hey, you guys down there. Hey, you guys down there. What you I'm the moderator. What are you saying? Oh, what are they saying down there? No, Charlie, I want, I want Charlie, you. Charlie got a comment about he what does. I'm saying. Yeah. He said, hey, hey, Bill, hey, Bill. Yeah. Man, Charlie in my ear. I, I know. always hear Charlie in my ear. <laughs> hey, I mean, hey, pass it to Charlie. Pass it to Charlie. Let me, let me be, be real clear <laughs> about Charlie. It is a long from, story. It ain't going to be a long story. It is a long story. He was from, I'm going to switch to Charlie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's switch to Charlie. He was from Harlem, and everybody in Harlem knew who he was. Yeah. Because he was a phenomenal ball player, for sure. Yeah. But 
when he and her brother were teammates at Stuyvesant High School, no, they didn't let John, him play. Looked, John looked around and Charlie was gone. <laughs> and he was he he said, I know what I don't know what happened to Charlie. Well he ended up going down to Long Break Institute. Yeah. Which was a watershed moment for him. Yeah. <laughs> because he, Dean Smith recruited him from Long Break. And and everybody had a watershed moment, but some of them were longer watersheds, bigger <laughs> watersheds. And with that, Coach Smith always says, pitch it ahead to the guy that's open. So pitch it to that man down there because I know, I know. I want you to talk about uh, your two best games at Carolina, the ones that you remember the most that popped for you. And then also I want you to talk about a couple games in the NBA that meant something to you because I know hey, you. Hey, before you go, yeah. real quick. I'm a moderator. Real I'm a moderator. Uh, Best thing that ever happened to me was was Charlie, uh, and he helped me get from Yugoslavia uh, back here to the states and to get to the Phoenix Suns. I mean that he put himself on the line for you to get me on the team. I mean I could play, and the, the, the Jerry Colangelo the same guy that's running it now, uh, was somewhat impressed. But because we played a game when I was with the ABA Colonels and we beat them <laughs> because we had Artis Gilmore and Dan Issel, so at the size the Phoenix didn't have. Anyway. anyway pa pa pass it ahead. He's ahead. He's in the open. Get it, move it ahead, and then, Charles, <laughs> you, you make the next couple plays. A couple a couple games at Carolina, a couple games in the NBA. Uh Against the best players here and the best players there. What well, you say? Well, my best, you know, not, not your oh. best game, but the ones that just stand out for you. The things that you, when you, when you look back, you played what you ever played here in eighty or ninety games in that league. You probably played eighty games a year for ten years, so you played eight hundred games. Yeah. But, well, but 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 a couple couple moments, a couple games that really stood out for you. Well, the first game is always going to be the ACC tournament against a mm -hmm. Duke. Yeah. You know, you know. 40, mm. 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40. Yeah. I was there. And, yeah. And, and, and the thing that that really made that uh, really, uh, you know, special was the fact that we had lost Dickie Grubar in that game. He had a, you know, knee, a, a, a knee injury during the game. And and here's a guy that's really been the starting quarterback for the team for two, for three years. And all of a sudden you lose him in the most important game because if you don't win the tournament, you don't go to the NCAA tournament at that time. So I mean, you know, you know, you know, that game to me was, you know, and I got 40 points, you know, so it really sounds good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, no, you know, it, it's not bad when you, uh -huh. you get 40. You know, you know, you know, that was the last that that, that yeah. game was the last game that Vic Boobas coached. He played in the NIT, I think, that year because yeah. we, we yeah. beat him. And Vic and I became friends later on in our career. And I said, you know, Charles and I, in your last game, combined for 45. He had 40. <laughs> I had five. <laughs> you know? And, and he laughed. He said, yeah, throw it to Charlie. Throw it to Charlie. <laughs> he said, that was your offense. Throw it to Charlie. Go ahead, Charles. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, so, I mean, that game, you, you know, you know, stand out to me, you know, the most. Um, and, 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 you know, really, and... It's really hard to say this, but, you know, basketball to me, and Carolina has been a great place to me. I've enjoyed it, you know. I enjoyed it when I was here, although it was hard times, but I enjoyed it. I think the people, I mean, were very friendly that could be friendly. But uh, during those times at Carolina, it was really very hard for me to enjoy life. Because everything was a, was really, a, 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 I knew I was under a microscope. So anything to me was just a point of satisfaction to know I didn't mess up, you know that I didn't that I didn't you know uh, mess up a situation. So you know there weren't many moments of enjoyment for me. There were moments of satisfaction and moments of relief. You know it's, it's like, and I never forget it. I mean y'all don't remember it, but after that game in, in Charlotte, everybody else went out to eat. And Coach Lott had to take me with him when we went and got a hamburger because, you know, I mean, you guys were going, y'all could all go hang out together, and I couldn't hang out with you. Even though I scored 40 points, I couldn't be with my teammates at that time, and Coach Lott had to take me someplace to eat at the end of there. So, I mean, most of my life was built in isolation, but, I, uh, but 
uh, I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea. The greatest thing that ever happened to me, there are two great things that happened to me, two great people in my life. One is a guy named Frank McDuffie, who is the, uh, was the president of Lomberg Institute. Because um, people probably heard the story. My greatest fan, and it's still probably one of my greatest fans, is Lefty Giselle. And Lefty and I are still very close. I call him all the time, and, and I talk to him all the time. And I feel like because Lefty Giselle was the very first person to recruit me. And he was at Davidson College at that time. And he was the first person, not, not only to recruit me, he was the first person in my life that I ever saw take interest in me as a person. And he liked me. And not only that, he used to let me, like, at that time, you could visit the school as many times as you want to. So every time he had a recruit come up, I would, he would have somebody drive me from Laurenburg hmm. up to Davidson to see the recruit. And then I end up picking the five guys that we end up playing against for the next two years in the Eastern Region Finals. I picked Doug Cook, and I picked Jerry Crowell, and I picked Mike Malloy. All those guys were not guys that I picked to go to school with. But then, uh, and, and you know, Coach Smith, at that time, Coach Smith was just really starting to, to become a good coach. And they had Larry Miller and, and Bobby Lewis on the team. But I remember the team before that, and I don't know, but all Utah Hills fans probably remember when Billy Cunningham was on the team. And for some reason, I always remember Billy Cunningham getting the rebound, dribbling up the court, taking a jump shot, and then running back the other end. So I said, gosh, he don't pass to anyone. So I got <laughs> so, so, so Carolina wasn't on the top of my list at that time. You know, you know. And, 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 but then, you know, I, I, I visited here, and, and, and really, like I said, uh, Mr. McDuffie has all, really deserves all the credit because I wanted to sign. I, I took early admissions to go to, to, go to uh, Davidson, and I made like 1496 on the SAT. Mm. So, so I told you, <laughs> smart. <laughs> so, you know, I was in for early admission, and I was accepted early admission to Davidson. So I wanted to sign a letter of intent early. But coach, my, my high school coach, who at that time was my guardian, kept saying, no, nah, you know, you can't sign to April 15th. So he wouldn't let me sign early. He said, I want you to keep visiting other schools to see how you like them. So for some reason, he kept bringing me up to North Carolina. <laughs> you know, and he kept bringing me up here. And then one weekend, and I think all of you probably remember, there used to be a weekend called Jubilee Weekend. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> who remembers Jubilee? <laughs> so... The, the weekend I visited for the last time was Jubilee weekend. And that weekend, they had Smokey Robinson and the Miracles and the Temptations. So and Sweet. Then, at that time, so then Larry Brown and Coach Smith was driving me back to Lomberg. And they said, well, Charles, how do you like it? I said, well, you know, I had a great time. You know, Smokey Robinson. Any school that got Smokey Robinson and the Miracles and the Temptations, this is where I got to go and whatnot. <laughs> so, so they said, well, do you want to go here? I said, but I always had an out. I said, yeah, I want to go, but my high school coach, who was my guardian, told me I can't sign any letter of intent, you know, to April 15th. Yeah. <laughs> so they drove me back to school, and Coach Smith got out and said, uh, Mr. McDuffie, Charles said he wants to go here, but he said you can't. He couldn't sign to go to any school until April the 15th. And my coach said, no, nah, he can sign to go to North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the network. That's part of the network in Laurenburg. <laughs> so, you know, he understood the importance of being the first black He made the athlete. rule and he made the exception. Yeah, you know, yeah. He, he understood he understood the rule. He understood the importance of it. <laughs> Where I was in love with, with Lefty, yeah. he understood the importance of the University of North Carolina. Yeah. And then Jubilee Weekend really helped me a great deal. <laughs> you know. And plus at that time, Davidson was all boys. Yeah. So it was all it was all boys at that time. It was all boys. And to be honest with you, and, and, and Bill Chambers from you know he's from Durham. There was a school called Hillside High School in Durham, and I played when I was in high school, and I got my first 
fan letter from a girl named Dolly Faye Smith. I still remember. <laughs> Anybody know Donny Faye? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so here it was. I was able to go to school in Chapel Hill, only eight miles from Durham, where I had a girl that really knew me already. Nice. <laughs> and that was better than going to Davidson, where it was all boys, and I had to go 20 miles to get to Charlotte. <laughs> So, I mean, I made up my mind and going to North Carolina on Smokey Robinson and the Miracles and the Temple. And that girl from Durham. <laughs> Thanks, Charles. Special. Be before uh, turning it to Bill Chambers for some, some comments and then coming to you a bit, I want to tell you a little bit about this because your classmate painted this picture. Okay, anybody remember Jeff McNally? So Jeff was our classmate. He, you know, he's from Long Island, from New York. He went to Exeter. He came here. He was on the Daily Tar Heel staff. He did a lot of etching, sketching. Became a Pulitzer Prize winning political cartoonist. But this is an oil painting of, of the three of us and Coach Smith. And if you look at it carefully, you'll see some etchings here. You know, Jeff passed away in 2000. Uh, but he created great comic strips and great uh, political cartoons. And he was considered to be the class clown when he was at Exeter. And he took, you know, his uh, notion for humor and irony into his profession. And this is a, a, a photograph that was taken by the staff at Ackland. The original oil painting, I believe, is in Coach Smith's estate. But I got uh, a, a photograph and then got my teammates involved. And I thought I'd bring here today so you could... See us 50, 50 some years ago. So, Bill Chambers, uh, like me, didn't get a chance to play a lot, but we played a lot in practice. We, we played awful hard. And somebody uh, sent me a note last year. It was really interesting. Does everybody remember the kid who's got into the portal named Playtech? Playtech, yeah. Has he gone into the portal? There. I don't know if he's, is he gone? Last year, he went in the portal. Last he year. went in the portal. Last year. Last year. So, so someone sends me this note, and, and it has my name in it. I said, why would I possibly be mentioned with Playtech? Because Playtech's four points put him ahead of me from the 237th <laughs> position scoring to 238th. <laughs> so that's why he's important to me. He, he by, bypassed me. So I'm like 239, 240 now. So I don't know where you are, Billy. But uh -huh. this guy could score, he could play hard. He, I'm just telling you, he could play at a lot of places and score a lot of points. We played against each other when he was in dental school with Judd Roberts, who was a very good player at Mercer and other guys. And so there are a lot of guys here whose names are not in the scoring list and didn't play in the league, but really loved the game and really were important. I always thought Coach Smith's uh, formula for players, four, four, and four. I was talking to John Beeline, a couple of coaches, and he said, what's four, four, and four? I said, that's the perfect team. You got four pros, potential pros. You got four good college players who take their position, and you got four walk-ons. Who can, because it's really hard to sit on the bench, especially if you think you want to be or can be. And so I always looked at the guys on the team, and, and, and if they love the game, they played hard. If they love North Carolina, they played hard. They were good teammates. And Billy was one of those guys who played on some really good teams, could have played a lot, scored a lot of points, and played a lot of minutes a lot of other places. But there are, I don't know if there's hundreds of them, but there's a lot of us. And I respect you for, uh, for that, Billy. Well, thank you, Jimmy. First of all, I want to let everybody know we brought some uh, photos for you today of some of the teams. The freshman team we played on uh, with Coach Williams on there, uh, also the uh, NIT championship team and the NCAA Final Four team in 71, 72, they're available for you to pick up here. First of all, it's an honor to be uh, with this group here, up here tonight. Secondly, none of you really understand, I think, the, the, the true essence of being a part of the Carolina basketball family, because uh, it's a special group, and it's well recognized across the country. As I think Duke tries to imitate us, but they'll never repeat us. Uh, so from the standpoint of, you know, experiences that we had, there are highs and lows. Uh, first of all, I think the low point for me in my uh, junior year was when we lost to South Carolina in the last few seconds at the ACC tournament. And then the high point is we turned it around because back then only one team could go to the NCAA and we were tied with South Carolina in regular season uh, winners. But we went on to the NIT and actually won Coach Smith's first national championship, which was the NIT championship in 
that year. And, of course, Bill Chamberlain was the uh, MVP of that tournament. The next year we came back and we had, uh, I think, a high point is that next year we won the ACC tournament. And then we had a chance for revenge because we played South Carolina in the finals of the Eastern Regional that year and got a chance to beat them in the Eastern Regional Finals. So those are a couple of the high points. You know, as a team member, you know, you win and lose as a team. You don't win or lose as individuals. And I think Coach Smith, uh, when he recruited me, I was a quote-unquote recruited walk-on. I was up for the Moorhead Scholarship, but I didn't get it because my SATs were not quite high enough to get in that uh, stratosphere, but Coach Smith said, if you come to North Carolina, I'll give you a scholarship after your first year. So I came to North Carolina, and I lived with all the other uh, recruited uh, players that year. And Denny Weissick and I were roommates for all four years here at Carolina. Of course, Denny's jersey's up in the rafters up there. And uh, I, uh, of course, I came because Coach Smith said, do you want to be a big fish in a little pond or a little little fish in a big pond and I wanted to go to dental school at the time so it made common sense for me to come there and a lot of you don't remember Dr. Oldenburg who was the uh, scorekeeper at North Carolina for years he was the uh, pediatric dentist uh, at the dental school that was very Coach Smith introduced him on my recruiting trip here so I, I wanted to go to dental school and so I ended up here and uh, during my four years here I had to spend a lot of time in studying uh, so but I played hard and I worked hard and and that's one thing I think Coach Smith always said, never leave the floor and think you didn't give your best. So every time I went to practice or every time I went to got a chance to play in a game, I did so. And one of the cultural things that we developed and over the years I was there, you had freshman teams that had a lot of unity there. And I hate that we don't have freshman teams there, but we still carry the tradition of JV teams. And, you know, Coach Williams will vouch for this. A lot of our people on our freshman team, we're still friends today. I mean, we still connect. And I actually had a reunion a few years ago for our freshman team. And Coach Guthridge was alive at that time, and he came to the freshman game. Because Coach Guthridge's second year here was uh, with our freshman team. And so the blue team, you know, and I brought the practice jersey, you know, it's blues were the second team, and they flipped it over for the whites. And so that's how you got blue team. So, uh, but your blue team members back in that day, you usually had five recruited scholarship players on the freshman team. So, and then when you came up as sophomores, they were five recruited uh, scholarship players. So these players that may be sophomores or juniors, they end up being starters their senior year or major contributors. So for, for me, we developed a culture of the blue team and, and our, we took great pride in making the starters work really hard every day in practice. I mean, Charlie may not remember this, but he had just gotten back from the Olympics in Mexico as that year, and, and I was a sophomore, and I had to guard him every day in practice. And he would leave practice, and his jersey wouldn't be wet, and I'd have to go wring mine out at the end of practice. So, uh, but Charlie helped me get in shape as a result of that because as I got through my years, I developed a nickname called Zoomer. And Zoomer wasn't that I could run so fast, but I ran fast the whole practice, the same speed. So, uh, so Charlie got me inspired to, to get in better shape. I do hold some records, though. Uh, I had the fastest time, but it has an asterisk next to it. My sophomore year, we used to have to run the mile uh, in time. What was your time? I ran at 5'11". It wasn't the fastest time. No, Charlie didn't, Charlie didn't have to run it. Charlie didn't have to run it that year. So as an asterisk, I said it's an asterisk next day. Charlie didn't have to run it that year, so I had the fastest time. But it's in the book. It's in the blue book. Wait a second. Uh, was Ricky was Ricky Webb there? You 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 were Ricky was breaking five minutes. Well Oh Ricky wasn't on that team. Ricky wasn't on that Ricky team. Ricky was up, but Ricky was up with Charles. He, he was the same year as us. Well it was fifty years ago. Who could that, remember? That, <laughs> Well, anyway, maybe the guys in 72 can't remember, but the guys in 70 can remember. Well, anyway, I'm in the blue book for two things. Uh, the fastest team mile for two years in a row. I like it. And then the, the one thing that a lot of times people, two other things. Sports Illustrated did an article on us, the tall blues, uh, in the year we went to the Final Four. And they interviewed Craig Corson. And Craig Tor Corson said, the blue teams are like the tall blue past blue ribbon beer. We keep on popping. Well, that was in the article, and Coach Smith didn't like that too much. 
Because the footnote after that, a team that parties together plays together. And so, uh, but the good news from that, of course, I think statute of limitations has run out on this. Uh, Paso Ribbon saw uptick in their uh, beer sales after that. And so they brought to Craig his dorm room, stacked his beer, his room from the beer from the ceiling to the floor that spring. And so the team got to drink free all that spring uh, as a result of that. And uh, so I thought that would be interesting. Second thing, my daughter also played North Carolina here basketball. She played for Coach Hatchell, and there's only two former players that had daughters play here, Al Wood and Bill Chambers. So I take great pride in that. And I want to thank Roy and Wanda Williams for all the stuff that they have done for the university, not just here, but also in Asheville. They've been very gracious with their time over the years. He's uh, obviously a great representative, and I, I practice in Asheville, so Roy is is obviously uh, loved by the folks in Asheville area, and he does have a house up there as well. And uh, But Coach Williams has been a special friend. When I first got to Asheville, he recruited me to be on his uh, City League team because he was at Owen High School coaching at that time. So I got the chance to play with him one more time uh, in the City League. And then I didn't get recruited out of college to play uh, any sports pro sports, but the Dental Blue team was a very good team back in the day. <laughs> really and good. So we won the campus championship many years in a row. In fact, we won it one year when Rusty Clark, uh, Postman, uh, all these other guys that were from colleges, Davidson, North Carolina, Dental School beat them in the championship. And then we had to play the, the football team one year with, when they had Lawrence Taylor and all those guys. But they made a mistake. They put us in Carmichael. Uh, a 95-foot court, and, of course, football players are 10 yards in a cloud of dust. So the first 10 minutes of the game, they're pinning balls on the backboard and stuff like The last 30 minutes, their tongue was hanging out. Uh, so we, we beat them. And, in fact, uh, the, our team was so good, Coach Guthridge actually had us play the freshman team one year uh, on, before one of the varsity games. But that wasn't fun because uh, – Crompton said a pick on me, and no one yelled pick. And the crowd went, oh, you know, because that was like hitting a brick wall. Hey, Bill, you remember who coached that team? Huh? You remember who coached that team when you played against the uh, freshman team? Coach Guthrie's and you. Yep, exactly right. <laughs> I said, Billy, pass the damn ball, will you? That's right. <laughs> To be a great scorer, you gotta you gotta really want it, and he could he could he could score he could he could score the wall. There's no doubt about it. But again, it's been an honor to be here today. And again, these guys, you know, they're they're the greatest, and uh, I'm proud in all their accomplishments because for me, it's an extension of me when they are successful. And so uh, it's just been a wonderful experience for me over the years. Thanks, Billy. Let's hear it for the guys. We've got a few minutes, uh, and so, like, uh, uh, question? Wait, wait, wait. Hold, I'm sorry. We do need to have them in the microphone so they can be recorded. Let's ask the question. Yeah, we, can hear you. We, can, we can hear you. How do you and Coach Williams see NIL affecting hmm. our sport? Well, we don't have NIL now. We have, so we have pay for play, and we have illegal inducements. NIL is actually okay. It actually could work. But we're going to need some help from the federal government to get that thing back in the box because there's, I don't think there's anything wrong. In fact, we had $15 a month laundry when we were here. And my first NIL experience was with Eddie and Charlie. We, after our eligibility was up, we barnstormed around the country. And so we, so we got Charlie's picture, Eddie's picture, my picture, and we put it in a three pack. And we gave Charlie two thirds of the money because he was responsible for 100% of the sales. <laughs> Bro, you want to talk a little bit about the NIL thing? Same answer, really. It, it's I sit on the fence on very few things, but NIL is one of them. The transfer portal, I think kids should have to sit out a year because I, I believe in facing adversity and being a better man. And they say, well, coaches could leave. And that's true, but kids could leave in the old days if you'd sit out a year. But uh, NIL, I sort of sit on the fence. Uh, Peyton Manning is uh, a great guy, a friend. Uh, Wrote me a handwritten note after retired, but I remember his last year at Tennessee. They sold 55,000 jerseys with Manning name on the back for $65 a clip, and he didn't get one cent of that. And that's not right. 
Uh, so there are some things. The NCAA itself right now is in disarray. But the last 10 years, we've gotten more student athlete friendly. Uh, we've done more for the student athletes. These guys, if they took out a recruit, and when Eddie and I were coaching, if, if a player took out a recruit, you had to take that money uh, for his meal out of his meal money. Nowadays, they get the money and they get to go out with eat with the recruit. So every your whole team wants to go out and eat with the recruit. But uh, also, we have uh, uh, true cost of attendance. Uh, so uh, Charlie and Bill from New York, they would get something like five to six thousand dollars a year in addition to room board books, tuition fees. So it's gotten better, uh, but there's still a lot of things that can be done for the student athletes. I always my always deal was that. Pick the best academic scholarship on campus, and the athletic scholarship should be just as good as that. And I'm like Bill. I was a candidate for a Moorhead Scholar, and the one thing I liked on there, and this was in 1968, uh, and it got a lot better over the years, but it used to be when I left here as an assistant, if you had the Moorhead Scholarship, you got room, board, books, fish, fees, and you got $5,000 incidental expense. And, you know, so I always felt like that the scholarship should be as good as the best academic scholarship. But it's, uh, it's the old Wild West out there now. It, you can't get it back, but hopefully we can do some yeah. things to make it better. And another question? Got time for another one? Jimmy. Right there. Right there. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm sorry, could you please wait for a microphone? Because we need it for the recording. Okay. It, is there any way that we could get you nominated to replace the president of the NCAA and take over that position? No. <laughs> you'd, you'd need my consent, and I wouldn't consent. <laughs> yeah. I, I got a story. We only have five minutes. So I want to give the, uh, the, the people a chance to ask their questions. Charlie, I wanted to ask you about that, that game that you played then against Davidson in the Eastern Regionals, you were playing against Coach Drizel. Yeah, yeah. What kind of conversation, if any, did you have after that game? That was the greatest <laughs> basketball game I ever saw. I watched it by myself, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Well, you got to remember, after that game, Coach Drizel left Davidson and went to Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> You ended, you ended Bubis' stay at Duke and Drizel's stay at Davidson. Well, well done, Charles. Billy. Well, uh, also, Coach Drizel was standing up and saying, he can't go left, he can't go left, he can't go He said it three times loud. Charlie went three years to the left, fade, jump shot, bang, game over. <laughs> game over. I was a freshman on, the, uh, on that uh, now the question out there, we got time for maybe one or a couple more. Yeah, we we're gonna get, we we need to get you a mic so that we can record this. I'm doing my job as a moderator. <laughs> Don't blame it on me. These are the rules. I'm, I apologize. This is kind of a downer question after all the fun we've had here. Yeah, that was supposed to be about fun, but go ahead, because <laughs> we believe in free speech. It ultimately will be, but uh, I guess. Okay, first of all, I'm an alien. I didn't go here, my husband did. Uh -huh. I went to a school called Madison College, now James Madison University. Sure. And it would bother me no matter where or who it was, but obviously this week, a young lady on the softball team took her own life. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, and I guess I feel like it's the elite programs, of which Carolina obviously is one, there's way more pressure on the athletes. Right. Um, I was just kind of curious. It, let, me, what, let, 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 me, let me try with that what one. What Carolina's doing. Well, I don't know what Carolina's doing, and I don't think any of these people do really either. But I think what's important to understand, when you're doing something at the highest level, there's always pressure. Pressure to compete, pressure to get better. And there is an enormous amount of resources available here and in other places with resources like this. I'm talking about academic counseling, mental support, um, access to the best medical care that exist at a, at a research institution. The issue of student um, depression is there. And it's not restricted to college athletes no. at all. This is an epidemic 
and the issues tied to suicide, I'm not talking about in this country, I'm talking about globally. If, if, if you read it, uh, it, it's a real issue in a way that it wasn't 25 or 30 years ago. So I don't care if you're trying to be the best surgeon, the best athlete, um, resources are here. And the, in the experience that we had here, you know, for many, many decades was a white male experience. And then it was black and white. And then it was binary, non-binary. Then it was international. And this is the highest level of competition outside the pros that you can be in. You better train, you better be well coached, you better work for balance, and you better be a reasonable student. That's pressure. Now, it's not like being in Afghanistan, it's not like being in the Ukraine, you're still on college, there's a lot of support here for you, but to think that there's not pressure on a college athlete for, in, in performance, in training, in every other way is wrong. And uh, it, it, yet, it's one of the great opportunities, and I'm hoping that we can get our arms around some of the crazy things that are going on in college sports today, because it, it's more than basketball and it's more than football. It's male, it's female, it's Olympic sports, and it's very public. And, and so it's also probably Arnie Duncan, who was the Secretary of Education, put it well once when he said, other than the military, intercollegiate athletics does more to build leadership capability and resilience than any other institution. And quite honestly, it's under some threat right now. Really? Yeah. Jimmy, can I say one thing? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Which maybe we can tie this up. We talk about family, and Eddie said something about it. This is your university, but I'm looking here and I can give you an example. Name my son after that guy. Eddie Fogler, when I was a part-time assistant, it truly was a part-time, as, as Coach Smith said, full-time job, part-time pay. I was with Eddie Fogler for eight years. I never paid for lunch in eight years. Eddie Fogler paid for it every day. When, we, when Bill Chambers came to Asheville, North Carolina, the first dentist that our two children ever went to was Bill Chambers. Bill Chamberlain right here has came to a hundred of my practices. A guy from New York City, a black dude from New York City who was smooth, I agree with Jimmy. <laughs> He's like a brother to me. And so that's what you have up here in front of you, is the University of North Carolina basketball team is the greatest family that's ever lived. I think that's a pretty good closing comment. Thank you for coming. It's been great to be part of the student body with all of you at the time we're here, and we all have fond memories of same. Thank you.